Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Pacific Partnerships in Education. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, uh, from Pacific Resources for Education and Learning. And with me today in the Think Tech studios is Dan Lin, also a, co a colleague from Prell. Uh, Dan is the director of the Pacific Storytellers Cooperative, a relatively new uh, initiative that we have at Prell and is a photographer, journalist, uh, man of many talents, obviously. <laughs> uh, was a, uh, spent some time on the Hokulea on several, several legs of the voyage there. Uh, so he's a voyager, uh, knows that whole end of the world. Um, educator, all kinds of, all kinds of talents here. Uh, why don't you tell us, Dan, a little bit about sort of what the Pacific Storytellers Cooperative is, is all about. Okay, yeah, thanks for having me on, Ethan. Um, I, as you said, um, I've been been fortunate enough to travel and uh, see and tell stories from the Pacific Islands, um, from the region that we work with, mostly the Northern Pacific, for the past seven years now. And uh, in doing so, you just hear and um, and interact with so many community members that have stories. So at some point, it just made a lot of sense to not only help tell the story as an outsider from that of that community, but also help create platforms for you know youth and um, and adults to tell their own stories. And so we created a, the Storytellers Cooperative, which is uh, essentially a, a series of not only platforms um, but also trainings and and tools and resources that allow communities to to have the tools to tell their own story. Right, and this is now set up online, so. Individuals can either tell or write their stories, send in photographs and videos if they want, in, in, in any sort of way they want, any format they want, almost capture their story, right? Right, right. And so it becomes much like a, pretty much like a, like a, a modern news site or a, a blog site where you, individual people from these communities have basically a contributor um, access and they can then tell and publish their own story from their own perspectives. Um, and I think that the, the multitude of perspectives adds a lot of just richness to the conversations. Yeah, and it's, it's saving stories that otherwise would just vanish, right? Right. Last person who knows them dies. You know, right. And said now they're digitally up, recorded and archived, presumably forever. Yeah, yeah. And I think just you know, like having all these different generations and the different cultures being represented, and having them being able to to have a place to 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 host and hold their their stories as sacred um, is really really um, special. And are there options on on this site to? have people comment on the stories and get conversations going about them? Yeah, because, absolutely. Yeah. So there are definitely spaces on the on the site. Um, there's a comment section. There's also like small sub subsections that we've created um, to, to allow for more individualized like content and, and more topic related stuff. Um, we also kind of broadcast it out and try to share it as far and wide as possible so that our young people in these islands know that their voices are being heard mm -hmm. and that, um, that there in turn leads to more likelihood and, and empowerment to continue telling their own stories. Right, because in a lot of cases these small islands don't have them. They're losing populations these days. They don't feel very heard in the world, right? They're, they're experiencing some of the worst impacts of for instance, climate change, and yet they don't, they sort of didn't cause much of this, but they don't seem to have much voice and much capacity to stop it, stop the impacts that is the rising sea level and all, right? So it's, but it's important then that at least yeah, people hear them, and so this, this is great that you're giving them a voice. Yeah. At, and all this can be found on the Prell website, right? Yeah, storytellers.prell.org. Storyteller, okay. um, and, uh, and yeah, we're continuing to grow and um, and reach out to more communities, so it's really exciting. Yeah, oh, excellent, excellent. And so, how did this then? This led you to an, an interesting journey you just took, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, this, what we're calling this, is the Nuclear Legacy Project, mm -hmm. um, and and it deals specifically with the Marshall Islands because that being a, a place that has a lot of nuclear legacy embedded into it. Um, right, for it, those of our guests, who, listener, viewers who might not know, uh, the Marshall Islands had 67, I think, nuclear tests done on two atolls. Right. Uh, and, uh, please. Yeah, no, this, you said it, uh, there's 67 <laughs> tests um, all um, after World War II, uh, starting in 1945, in Bikini Atoll and in Enewetak Atoll. 
um, and they're the far northwest islands and the Marshall Islands. And um, why, why were those particular ones chosen? Do you know? Um, you know, it's it's hard to say. Sp I, I personally, I think it's because of the remoteness um, and because they're. I think. The, the atolls were relatively um, ha had fewer populations than other other atolls. Um, right, just easier to move. Yeah, yeah, the and island. they were they were you know displaced and, and moved to to other places um, while this was happening, um, which which therein leads to another aspect of that legacy, you know, um, being displaced um, citizens. Sure. And so, um, yeah, so I think the remoteness plus. Um, you know, the ability to be away from bad press probably right. had to do with some, some of it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so those were the two um, of which I think, uh, you know, 43 were done in Enuetak and 24 were done in, in Bikini. Okay. Um, including the, like the big one, which is uh, Castle Bravo. Um, that, was, uh, that was done in Bikini, it was 15 megatons, um, roughly a thousand times bigger than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. So it was, yeah, these are not small, like, tests. These are major, massive tests that's, that... Um, that's equivalent to 15,000 tons of TNT, then, basically, in the blast power. Right, right, right. right. And so, yeah, it was big. It, it basically, um, you'll see later in some of the photos, like, it annihilated an entire stretch of an island um, about a mile wide. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of public archival government footage of just how big this bomb was. It's, it's, it was massive. Yeah, yeah. And then, so you went, as part of this project, and you recently went out there and visited this site. I did, yeah. It was, it was crazy. Um, about three, three and a half years ago, I was sitting in a cafe in the Marshall Islands in Majuro, the capital, um, with my friend and project uh, partner, um, uh, Kathy, Kathy Jetniel Kijiner, who's a, a poet, a very talented poet, and, um, and a spoken word artist and an activist um, from the Marshall Islands. And she and I were just kind of like, brainstorming ideas and thinking about all the projects we wish we could have done and one one idea she said was you know there's this there's this place out there in the in the outer islands it's called runit um, it's one of the islands where they there's a big concrete giant concrete dome where they buried all the nuclear waste that was done in, in that area and um, and it's just there and very few people know about it and um, yeah here's a here's an image um, here's an image of the dome uh, oh. on the island itself um, it's about half a mile wide um, and here's a uh, you know people walking on it. Yeah. And her vision was, she told me, she says, I've always wanted to do a poem, to 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 perform a poem on top of this dome, to show people, like to bring exposure to this place, which you can see from a satellite. I mean, it's pretty it's pretty stark, um, and it's just you know it's concrete mixed with plutonium uh, that was cleaned up from th this place. And uh, I had known nothing about it, but after doing my research, um, it became part of my kind of hope and dream as well. And that was three years ago. Um, so if you fast forward to maybe several months ago, we were having this conversation again. Um, and this time, uh, we were doing so with uh, several people from the Okeanos Foundation, um, who provide um, these big, beautiful canoes, uh, these modern, modern canoes with traditional designs. We call them bakamotus. Um, for sustainable sea transport, and they were willing to get us out there um, without actually having to burn any, you know, fossil fuels. Um, and we were going to sail out there, and um, and they were really supportive of the idea. So uh -huh. that turned into, you know, that was kind of our our spark that we needed, and uh, we just kept fanning that flame. And yeah, and last month we actually went out there. So mm -hmm. we sailed. Um, it was a uh, it was a long, it was a total of, uh, I think, 11 to 12 days at sea. Um, uh, but it was, yeah, so we sailed out there and got Kathy on the canoe and several crew members that had never done deep ocean sailing before, not crew members, several people that had never done deep ocean sailing before. And we sailed them 1,800 miles um, <laughs> to the far reaches of the Marshall Islands so and back. From Majuro. Yeah, from Majuro to, all the way to Enuetak and then from Enuetak to Bikini and then Bikini back. Uh -huh. Um, and you know, props to them and props to the crew because you know it was it wasn't easy. It was definitely a long and arduous trip. The seas were big, um, the wind was rough at times, and so um, everyone was safe. Everyone was um, everyone. You know, nobody got too seasick. And uh, and then you know, after that, after all of that grueling like hardship, then we actually had to go go to work. You know, get on the, get on this island actually and do, and do the work. 
And so it was really, really rewarding. I think we all bonded through just this incredible journey of, of you know, of place and, and, and understanding what happened. And, you know, so, yeah, that was a very emotional trip. Yeah, because this is really, it, it's a unique spot, right? I mean, nowhere else in the world have we set off like a whole bunch of nuclear weapons at surface, just above the surface. Uh, they, they had, I guess, bombs. They were testing new designs, some of which didn't quite work well, and left scattered radioactive fuel splattered all over this island. I mean, yeah. Essentially, and we talked basically got sterilized as a spot, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, and that's that's the that's the crazy thing is that like you know some of the bombs that didn't explode, um, there's just globs of you know plutonium scattered around these islands. Um, and and that's why this dome was was created to as as a way of kind of cleaning up some of that mess. Um, right, because the military knew eventually you can't leave that stuff sitting around loose. I mean, somebody can come in there and grab it and do ugly things with it. Right, right. And it was part of the agreement for the community when they were moving back that mm -hmm. there would be a cleanup. Um, and unfortunately, that cleanup is essentially dumping it on, keeping it on the same island with an, and capping it with a dome. Mm -hmm. Um, and in other places, you know, it's a removal of military structures and it's like replanting um, certain places, um, Bikini Atoll being one of them where, you know, entire, you can see like lines of coconut trees, like very evenly spaced. Um, and that's because all of the vegetation on this island had, had died um, after the nuclear fallout of Castle Bravo. And so, you know, they had to replant um, trees from all around the other Marshall Islands um, to, to, to make it. But it looks very noticeable. It's very odd and eerie that there's such perfect parallel lines of coconut trees. Mm -hmm. um, so while it's still beautiful and, and, you know, the island itself still has its own um, identity and character, it just has this tragic kind of like glimpse of what had happened here. Right. And the military at one point basically had declared it safe to move back, right? And for some period of time, people actually moved back there and lived, right? But they found that well, it wasn't, right, it wasn't right. as clean as they thought. Right. The initial tests um, for bikini, at least, were, um, were done and uh, they were cleared. Community members were cleared to move back. And there was a village built. You know, there were structures and there was homes built. And then it was only after later tests several years down the road um, that they were found that you know, actually, you know, it's still considered unlivable. The topsoil was, was not safe. Um, and so the things that were being, were being consumed were not safe. And, and then the, the community of Bik the Bikinians had to re, you know, leave the they island. Move once again. Remove, so yeah. Displaced yeah. once and then displaced again. Yeah, so it's a very tragic yeah. story. It's one that's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just kind of swept under the rug in a lot of conversations, but like this, this community has been, been yearning to live at home, you know, um, and that home is kind of culturally and I guess scientifically deemed unlivable. So it's been, it's been a hard journey for them. Right, because these uh, Marshall Islands have been uh, occupied for roughly 2,000 years, right? Uh, some, some, something that order and, and People would settle them, and their descendants would live there, and so that you have these communities who live for generation after generation after generation on Bikini or in a Talk or Majuro or wherever right. they may have been, right? Right. And then the folks on Anuwe Talk and the folks on Bikini were basically just up and told one day, move and right, right, yeah, right. And, and, and there were conversations that were that were made and between you know the communities and and the military. Um, but I think at, at its core, nobody, especially from the community side, could ever fathom what it meant to actually have nuclear bombs being exploded in their islands. You know, like that's, I think, you know, to, to say that we're using these islands as tests for, you know, for homeland security is different than saying we're going to explode a 15 megaton, you know, bomb, in, you know, that's, that's going to essentially wipe out all vegetation and all life. Um, we are going to dig more deeply into this when we come back. Uh, I'm here with Dan Lin from Perel from the Pacific Storytellers Cooperative. I'm Ethan Allen, your host uh, here on Big Tech Hawaii for our Pacific Partnerships in Education, and we'll be back in one minute.
Hi everyone, I'm Andrea Gabrieli. I'm the host for Young Talents Making Way here on FinTech Hawaii. We talk every Tuesday at 11 a.m. about things that matters to tech, matter to science, uh, to the people of Hawaii with some extraordinary guests. The students uh, of our schools who are participating in science fair. So Young Talents Making Way every Tuesday at 11 a.m. only on FinTech Hawaii. Mahalo. Welcome back to Pacific Partnerships in Education. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Think Tech Hawaii. With me today in the Prowl studio is Dan Lin, also from Prowl. Uh, he's the head of the uh, Pacific Storytellers Cooperative. And we're talking about the nuclear legacy in the, in the Marshall Islands, fundamentally. Uh, this is uh, post-World War II, the US basically needing to test a bunch of their weapons, clear people off of two particular atolls where they lived for a long time and what about testing nuclear weapons of various designs, various types, setting off huge things, devastating these islands, literally all virtually sterilizing them as it were, mm -hmm. uh, displaced the communities, communities briefly moved back to the Bikini, but then we're told it was not safe, although they thought it was. So they're still living in other spots, many live on Majuro now. Um, yep. But you, you, so, and you went on this journey and you got there to NOE Talk and found there are people who live not on the islands that were actually bombed themselves, but they live on adjacent islands, right, in other parts of the atoll, right? Right, right. Enowatak Island is in and of itself um, part of the atoll, and you can see actually from this photo, this is the welcome sign you get when you arrive there, and actually within that picture, in that logo, is the dome itself. So it's become part of this identity that the, that the, the community has accepted, that there's actually a giant concrete dome. It's a very unnatural picture um, in terms of its, you know, from, from an island perspective. But this community has um, it really surprised me. Um, I, I, was very, I was very moved when I came to this community, uh, and I wasn't expecting to be. I, was, I came with the expectation of having a staging area before we would actually go out and do our, um, our film project that Kathy and I had set up to do three years ago. Um, but when we arrived at this, at this atoll in this community, they were just so welcoming. There was, you know, and, I, and I say that because all you know, Pacific Islanders and all these r rural communities are always welcoming. Right. But I think this particular community, one being so tied to this concept of nuclear fallout and radiation and they, all these words, they don't get a lot of visitors. Not a lot of people right. want to visit a place right. that, that has <laughs> a, a connotation of being radioactive. Right. And there's not a lot of economic stimulus for a place. You know, you can't really like produce anything and sell it if there's, you know, you can't can't sell coconut or fish or anything that has the you know the possibility of being radioactive. So these guys aren't used to seeing a lot of outsiders, yeah. um, and they're just so welcoming. The kids, the the, the young adults, the, the you know the elderly, they're just amazing human beings. And I think having such a focused um, mentality on doing this project and really the somber element of it, seeing the joy in the kids and and, and the community. Uh, at having people come visit them was really um, it kind of threw me for a loop. You know, uh, it was really, really emotional and touching. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. And I guess we can move ahead with the next set of photos there. This is sort of what you saw then when you got there, beyond beyond the people, right? Yeah. So this is the island, actually. So it's not very long um, or wide, as you can tell. Um, that's the right. school right there in the middle, um, and it's there's a lot of there are remnants of you know uh, of kind of US occupation and, and kind of the, the, the military buildings and things. But essentially it's, it's, it's a village and yes, they are about 15 miles downwind of this big radioactive dome that's leaking. Um, but uh, there's just this resilience to them, you know, being able to live in this, such a tight environment and yet just being joyful and, and, um, and celebrating the presence of outsiders nonetheless. You know? oh, amazing, and amazing. So, yeah, it was very, it was, it was, this is the runway. So this was built um, during the war. And, uh, and the big problem here is that not only is it a massive runway for, for not, definitely not for commercial airplanes, these are for military airplanes. Right. Um, it also cuts right through the most, like the, the most like arable and um, part of the island. That's the widest part of the island. So, you know, your major crop growing area for self sustainability mm -hmm. um, sustenance are, is kind of ruined by having this runway. And that's part of the community's argument is that like we've lost so much of our viability to be economic, right. uh, economically sustainable 
that um, this is the story we'd like to tell. You know, and uh, there's a lot of abandoned structures. I just uh, happened to find myself in one of them. Um, a lot of the structures, actually almost all the homes uh, you see there are these kind of massive, concrete -y, um, very, very big and um, just, they're not, they're, they're, they're very out of place in the island communities, you know, if you... Built, built by the military in World War II? Uh, I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know that this kind of structure is meant for um, more secure against, you know, to be more secure against radioactivity, mm -hmm. um, being that it, it's all concrete from the very top to the very bottom. It's just a concrete shell. Um, and all, every house is like this in the mm -hmm. community. So I think that that's, I, I, was, I was kind of taken aback by seeing that. Yeah, yeah. It's not not a traditional uh, right. light, light housing material. It's right, so common. right, and it's, it's yeah. I'm guessing it doesn't have good, very good ventilation right. and, and all the things that you know you like to appreciate in the islands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that yeah, was definitely a, a, an interesting. Mm -hmm. um, it was very. I don't think not, I, any of us really knew that we would get so connected to the to the people of this community. Mm -hmm. um, they fed us. They housed us. They, they, you know, they they came with us wherever we needed to go. They gave, showed us around. Um, we actually did a storytelling workshop at the school. Mm -hmm. There, there's a there's an elementary school, and um, and it was really awesome. You know, like we Kathy led a poetry workshop, and uh, one of our colleagues from the University of Edinburgh, um, Michelle, she helped to lead also um, support in this in this storytelling workshop. Mm -hmm. And uh, what came of it were really powerful po poetry, um, stories, and just reflections um, from young people that didn't know of the world before, you know, before all these concrete sh structures and, and bombs and all these things. That all they know is just the life around them. Right, because they, I've grown up in this small, isolated, very isolated community where that is sort of the defining feature of it now, basically. Right, it's, right. It's, it's, for their whole lives, that's been what people talk about, what, what sort of keeps both keeps people away in some sense because they don't have yeah they don't have tourists they don't have any exports yeah uh -huh. yeah yeah and it's just something that I always have to remind myself is you know uh, for, for a young person the what they see around them is that that's their reality they don't you know we always kind of like want to romanticize a, a world before the war before bombing and mm -hmm. stuff um, but young, you know, the young people uh, who who may have never read about these kinds of conversations, they they just see the concrete around them. They just see, you know, they see the islands around them, and they they try and live the best life a, a kid can live. Yeah, um, yeah. Which is yeah, which is incredible. Utterly, yeah, utter, utter, utterly astounding. So such a very different life. It's a very yeah. different life. Um, yeah. And you know what? What sorts of Takeaways do, do we do we get from this? Well, um, the one thing that we you know the the video that we, we created um, we're creating in the process of creating, which should be released and um, within by next month. Uh, we're really excited about that because ultimately, you know what ha what happened has happened, and and um, what we what we're hoping to get the biggest takeaway for us is to be able to hopefully make other people around the world aware that um, there, there are communities that deal with the legacy of decisions that were made um, you know, half a century ago in, in places that are very far away. Mm -hmm. um, and in this, I guess in the modern day where you know, um, the rhetoric around nuclear uh, weapons, nuclear war is, is uh, prevalent um, to say the least, I think it's important to educate um, or, or make aware that um, there actually is people who have stories to tell on the other side of that. Yeah, I mean, this should actually be of tremendous value to places like Fukushima, right, where they have now, they're going to be dealing with the same kind of thing. They're going to be dealing with a sort of massive radioactive crud right. uh, left behind that they are, I mean, for the next century, that's going to be a defining point of that, of that Part of Japan, right? Right, right, right. Um, and I just think like that that the, the dialogue and the conversation needs to go on. It needs right. to ha continue to ha happen and to be reminded that um, that these these issues are, are are far from like um, 
far from safe and, and remote. They're very present in so, a lot of people's lives now. Right, and um, the, uh, these populations who both were exposed um, initially to the testing, and I suspect out of people who live near and we talk, uh, horrendous cancer rates, um, and certain, certain kinds of cancer rates, 10, 20, 40 times what the rest of the world population has for, for some forms of cancer. Um, right. So again, you know, huge fallout, yeah. so pardon the pun, uh, that you know, nobody really particularly anticipated. Uh, and, and these groups are just having to live with it. It's part of their life. Uh, yeah. They, they, you know, well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. Utterly amazing, utterly amazing. Um, parting thoughts, do you have a message you'd like to put out? Um, the, I think the message will be very uh, prominent and clear in, in, the, in the video and the stories that we tell um, from this trip. We're still in the process of editing and unpro unpacking. Um, on the Storyteller's website, there are a few blogs written by myself and Kathy and others um, regarding the, the reflection of the trip. But the actual, like the big, um, the reason why we went, the, the, that came three, three and a half years ago, that will be uh, hopefully debuted and, and disseminated across, um, hopefully as, as wide of an audience as possible. And I hope, and I do wish that this community that are watching, um, stay tuned and maybe we can connect them to that video. All right, so again, it's Storytellers, Dot prel dot org. Yeah, storytellers.prel.org um, to read some of the reflections, and then within a few weeks you'll see the video out. Yeah, yeah, and the, the, even the initial rough cut was just awe-inspiring. Thank um, you, thank you. Just, just amazing. I, I stunned you were able to do that work. Uh, good, good for you to for doing that. Great for Kathy to be making this a, a cause, and and I'm really raise an issue that needs to be raised, because there's lessons here for the world uh, about the power of nuclear weapons, uh, about the legacy, the costs uh, of nuclear weapons. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and this and other stories are what we hope to continue to strive for in exactly. telling in the future. No, well, it's, it's great to have you here, Dan. I very much enjoyed having the, you here on, and uh, I, I wish much luck with this Pacific Storytellers Cooperative. We will see you next week, uh, two weeks from now, we hope. Uh, on another episode of Pacific Partnerships in Education. Thank you, Dan Lewin. Thank you. Yeah.